I want to welcome everybody here at the Strandware Book Room. My name is Nancy Basswide, and I'm the owner of the store. For a little bit of history, my grandfather founded it in 1927. It was uh, founded in an area that was known as Book Row, which uh, ran from Union Square to Astor Place. And at its height, it housed 48 bookstores. And 89 years later, um, today, we're the only ones that the only bookstore that remains from that day. My dad is also a, an owner. He um, he mans the the used book counter downstairs. So please um, be sure to stop by and say hello to him. I'm so pleased tonight and so honored and excited to welcome William Wagman, pioneering video artist, conceptualist, photographer, and painter. Been exhibited everywhere, including the Whitney, MoMA, LA Country, uh, County uh, Museum of Art, Smithsonian, in best selling books. I counted 12 adult and 19 kids' books, as well as tons of videos that were screened as in places like SNL and famously Sesame Street. Um, my kids grew up um, laughing and learning while reading your books, so thank you for that. Um, tonight's book, Paintings, features essays from several luminaries, including award-winning and beloved NPR and Radio Lab host, Robert Coleridge. Thank you. So I just feel so lucky to have both of them here and all of you here tonight. Um, please join me in welcoming Robert and William to the Strand. Thanks. Thank you. So just just so I get this, like you, you like you did your grandfather form found Benjamin Bath. Benjamin Bath, not Benjamin Strand. <laughs> <laughs> so why is it called the Strand? Um, it was it's a, um, a an area in London that my grandfather oh. loved. He was a little bit of an Anglophile, and it of course had the publishing district. Yeah, and you know bookstores were there too, and then there was a magazine called the Strand with Arthur Conan Doyle founded. I see. So we he had was an pretending employee. to be in England, kind of. Yeah, we had an employee for a while that uh, ran the events program. Kaylin runs it now, and her her name was Jessica Strand. She was the uh, poet, the famous poet's um, daughter, and they she would be on the phone all the time explaining that she had nothing to do with the Strand, <laughs> even though she had the last name. Was it like, there's probably someone on the Strand, on the well, no, on Charing Cross Road in London who has to explain why they're <laughs> named Strand. Anyway, but you don't care about that. This is uh, Bill Wegman. Um, uh, let's see. And this is Robert, who can yeah. talk about anything and will. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I want to start just with this. With the stuff you've been doing lately is is very postcardian. Uh, that is not an artful term. It just uses postcards. So I, I, I first of all, just it's a funny it's a funny way to address the universe to start with a postcard. And I'm just like, did this uh, did this happen to you in a flash? Or did you go to some class at school, which they taught Postcard 101, and you somehow got a graduate postcard degree? Or I don't think that's it. I think we're off. But uh, the first time that I, you know, I, I my background is painting, but I got sidetracked by photography. And during a r really down period in my photography, I tried to paint on them to make them, to, to salvage them. So that was the first time I sort of ah. added paint to, uh, to a photograph. And then along the way, I s got the funny idea to alter greetings of greeting cards, making them more evil, I suppose. So that, <laughs> that kept me amused for a while. And, and, uh, and then so I... So happy birthday on your 35th birthday got somehow mustachioed or something? Well, or? I think the funniest one I did was, was uh, not congratulations on your grandchild, but I change it to what's with your grandchild. <laughs> and I made the eyeballs popping out. So, uh, so you know, just perverse and subversive and somewhat. So, you know, I sort of, but but the postcards specifically, I that was so cool. I was just thinking, the, so like, did you go to the Hallmark section and just uh, think of evil thoughts? Well, we all get things like that. Yes. So, oh. um, Huh. Yeah, but for postcards, the first time I, I altered a postcard was making a parody of a nature book. You know, one of those with specimens and and transcendental writing and anything I could think of that had to do with with uh, with uh, nature. And uh, I connected some postcards that I had 
of my area up in Maine that I go to, old cabins from the turn of the century, and I connected a couple of them. So that was the first time. So you just you put one up on a, on in an empty space, and then another, and you thought, now what could happen that would get me from this to that? Yeah, and it was I invented a new story. But I've always been interested in when you look out a window, what can't you quite see, and you can only turn your head so far. But in a picture, you can't turn your head. You just have to imagine what's out there. So. So, oh, so, so in some that. ways you were getting free of the postcard and you were dreaming yeah, beyond what, the postcard. What's post next? I did that actually with a with a amateur artist painting that uh, my grandmother had of a harbor scene in Provincetown where I copied that part of her painting and then extended the whole scene into like a six foot canvas. So uh, I had a, few, a little bit of history with extending things like That's this. An, it's an interesting mindset that sees the postcard as a prison from which one must get liberated. Uh, let me just, uh, can we just go, we're gonna go to either side of this screen and uh, just take a look at, at what he's talking about. So this, can you point to, in this particular painting, which one is, where is the postcard? Here's the postcard, it's uh, a monk painting of uh, Ed, the Norwegian guy? Yeah, yeah okay. that guy. And uh, obviously he's outdoors, but I imagined I just stuck it to th this panel here and painted him as though he was at a desk. And then I invented some other I, I made this so it could be windows. You might be looking at Wait, 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 wait. When, you when you decided to have him writing or drawing or whatever at a desk, did you laugh your way from here to there? Or worry your way from here to there? Or were you deciding that he didn't deserve to be out there on those rocks? That he should probably, he was an indoor kind yeah, of person? The thing that made me laugh most was keeping the white border. Rather than just connecting <laughs> him, I said, that is really funny, Bill Wegman. Uh, Got to hand it to me. But I gave him... Uh, this, this, I happen to have a desk very much like this in my studio. But what kind so. of a desk has drawers on the it's back? A, it's a partner's desk. So oh. on the other side, yeah. Oh, so I, I have this desk, and um, I tried painting it without the drawers, but I liked it that way. It's sort of a flip, even because I'm flipping the, uh, the character from outdoors to indoors. I can flip the drawers. And uh, well, I kept uh, it. Is, is, so this is a painting, but also it's attached to him. So it's some. It's in some kind of. But are these in your mind, like outdoor? This is a painting called indoors outdoors. So I don't know whether were you wondering like because look the ocean goes on and on and on right yeah and they could be they could be paintings and i left it ambiguous could this be a painting in fact i left this one like that for some reason i wanted it kind of pencily <laughs> that's why i kept what do you mean for I, some reason well for for our artists read painters can't talk so they talk oh, like that their painters talk about the upper left hand corner and the lower right and things like that they I see. they don't photographers talk forever because they have so much time when you when you study art and you're if you're a yale photography major you have to learn how to talk for six hours in, in a room about nothing but painters they can brush around ceramicists even more so. <laughs> so this is my painter versions of things. Okay. But I like the pencil lines because so I gave him the pencil. So it almost explains that. So you make up reasons for it to to uh, to be. It's kind of interesting. Well, let me ask another question. Is uh, did when you put do you do you start with the postcard just? Yeah. That's what I do. I start with postcard always in the middle. In the middle. I might move it. I put it temporarily with some sticky stuff and eventually... Uh, is it I'm an actual postcard that someone this once is, mailed to someone this, else? This one might have been... I don't know where I got it. I have, as you've seen in my studio, yes. thousands. So, yeah, who, uh, by the way, sends you like... Wait, do, you, do, you, do you go to postcard... Auctions, or I, mean, uh, I'm not sure I don't. No. Uh, I don't. People send them me their entire collections. I've gotten a huge amount of them, and occasionally I'll have to go look for one. Uh, but how that's many rare. postcards do you have at home now? More than fifty. <laughs> 
Maybe 5,000. I don't know. Yeah. Just suitcases filled with them. Yeah. And ha have you yet to examine most of them? You know, I've tried to organize them a little bit. Some have borders, which makes it more difficult to connect unless I'm clever. Uh, um, <laughs> others have, or, or there's, I've gotten to know them pretty well. Some are quite beautiful. Some are too so you beautiful. Will just dr you will drif drift down through your enormously weird building. You will drift down to the postcard corner and sit quietly in the corner just gazing at postcard after postcard. After well, postcard. it'll really annoy me when people come over and they'll go, oh, they'll look at my painting and they'll go, my uncle and I stayed there in that motel. <laughs> and that's not what my composition is about. <laughs> but when people come over, they do s shuffle through and they do, I have noticed they have a relationship to certain cards. And everyone does, but I imagine that's going to be gone one day since no one sends postcards anymore. Yeah. Uh, there, was, there was a real history of it. Yeah. And, uh, Actually, in the first section of the book that people should buy is just that, called How Come Postcards? Where Did They Go? And What yeah. Happened In Between? But let me uh, ask about uh, the underside. Do you ever, if, if there's a message there that says something beautiful like, Darling, this is the last time you'll ever hear from me. I'm on the front lines in the Battle of the Bulge. Sincerely, Gregory. And then you go, yeah. so there's now glue. Do you yeah. like... Uh, Even you more selfishly, I've just glued a priceless stamp worth $3 million and lost it forever because I've glued it. Oh, I hadn't even thought of that. Yeah, isn't that something? Is that that's not true though? Well, right? it could be. It, you know. <laughs> <laughs> All right, oh we'll just God. pass over that. Do yeah. you know? But when I you do preserve the backs. So I have them photocopied, and I have a. a oh, yeah. You I, have a I, photocopy. I, I photocopy the backs, so. Um, when you buy this painting, I will show you the back of that card, whether there's a message on it or not. And some paintings have like a 50 cards, and I've gone through the, the ordeal of photocopying those as well. Did you know, when you put the postcards down center, did you know what the painting you were about to paint was about at all? No, it took me, you know, just, uh, just uh, dreaming about it. I'd walk into my studio and go... For instance, this light came last. That that needs to be there. How should it be hung? Should it be on? What, how, what color should the walls be? The floor. I love painting floors. But uh, yeah. that's how big should the room be? When shall it turn? Those are things that... Uh, how much should this tone be? Should it be gray like that or brown like that? Well, do you change your mind? Was this, was this floor ever red before it was... There was a lot of fudgeting around with where the feet should be. Uh -huh. you know, how much detail should they have? So, but this is like this is a, this is a puzzle that you're working out in the moment every day. Pretty much, yeah. They're up. I have about three or four paintings up right now. Some big, some little. That uh, and when I go to Maine, there's some smaller things I work on. Let me let's go. Let's go to the next one. Uh, now this is just first of all. Where is the postcard here? There are three. And Where's the focal postcard? The first one is here. It's a palace in Vienna. So I'm going to... It goes... Yeah. Yeah. And this is an Italian uh, World War II <laughs> card. Pretty funny one. Uh, parachuting down. It goes... So I had to invent invent that in this character. Wait a second, you, the, the postcard shows a paratrooper landing on a lady in a beach? Yeah, it has got some, in Italian, it's got some lascivious remarks, I'm sure, which I don't know of, but, uh, so, I have no, so, you put this one down, and then you put this one down, and thought, like, now, yeah. what is the possible? No, I put this one down, and then I probably started painting, and then I went, wow, this is really going to be impossible, how am I going to put that card in, and why should I? This so is a, a professor of some sort, like yes, some guy it, with glasses. It's a, a student and a professor. The card is just there's just a little piece of. What kind uh, of a card is this? What it's from Wesleyan University. Oh, well, that like, explains I, that. I go to Wesleyan. <laughs> so it's got a little corner of this person's hair. So I had to invent her. Yeah. Doesn't show that. This guy is pretty much there, and I can kind of determine that he's probably at a desk. Like, if we can go back here and see the monk painting again. Oh, no, that's a whole different thing. Um, <laughs> we remember the monk yeah. painting. So he's at a desk, yeah. and I don't know why I gave him a red book, but... So this is the only part of this guy. You see that little shoulder there? Yeah, that's part of the postcard. Yeah. So huh. the rest of him, I had to... This is hard. I had to paint all of that stuff. So you d you imagined a museum that goes on the length pretty much of yeah. a Boeing 747 assembly plant. Yeah. 
and then you put a girl being uh, 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 visited by paratroopers and a professor from Wesleyan talking to only this person, not those. They're looking down no, at the... they're looking at the palace there. Yeah. And some other students are coming to see what's going on here. So when you here, fall into these in. narratives, do you begin to take sides? Do you begin to blame, like, why don't you turn around? I mean, the man is talking, or could you... Well, um, I would blame him for going this way because I want... I want you, the viewer, to look down here more. So I put him there going, look down there, like this fellow is. And then once you're there, I want you to kind of look back at, uh, you know, this guy. And when you're so doing this, are you, um, are you at a play of your own devising and there's theater at, in the air? I'm, or are you just I'm struggling with, uh, since, I, since I gave up painting for so many years, I'm, I'm kind of catching up with my painterly skills. And I'm realizing with a postcard, you don't have to be that good because the postcard gives you the incredible snap. What I got to do is be lousy enough <laughs> up there so that seems right. If this is too good, this doesn't seem right. So it's a way of accepting oh. my my uh, weak painterly skills. I'm, I'm not. Well, but uh, there are interesting things going on. Like the floor has been highly polished by some wax machine, yeah. but not so well polished that you can't somehow eke itself into sand. Yeah. on a beach littered with trash. I mean, that's kind of an... Like just walking from here to there is kind of interesting Thank to you. me. I know Thank it's you. not an artsy Thank you, Robert. Thing. <laughs> yeah. uh. All right, well, so so um, I guess I'm... Well, let's go... Let's do the... Ne let's... Uh, what's the... Oh, the hopper... Or let's take a look at the next one. This, this is, is kind of like different. A, this, this is, is kind of uh, different. This is a big painting. It's It's got three four by six foot panels put together. And maybe we should go to the detail first. Yeah, let's go. Okay. So I started with this card, the Hopper painting, and radiated lines off that until I... So this is like what you did in the last one. You, you have a line here, mm -hmm. and you just, keep it, you just keep going. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Do you want to go to the full thing now and see? Yeah, let's go to the full one. Let's go to the... That's an almost full one. There, there we go. There. So that's wow, the whole that's thing. A, that Edward Hopper thing at the center is kind of small in the full composition. Yeah. Okay, so... so and it's it called Hopper Origami because this is Hopper. This up here is a Hopper extended. And this is an origami tree at the Natural History Museum. So, and I made the, the folds of the rest of the shapes possibly origami-esque. Well, it's true that there's folding. I mean, you can sometimes read this line running right into, and you can see it there. You can see, I don't know if you guys can see this border, but the thing that sort of tr tricks me up a little bit is, whoop, like everything else is ruler, 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 whoop. Yeah. Well, so like, what was what was happening there? Did you just? Yeah, I needed a bucket for something to fall into, right? To uh, ah. to. to uh, it's just uh, that card called for the curved lines, although not quite so curvy. And uh, it's sort of. It's How like long did this take? It took a long time. I I, I think. Uh, you know, there's certain problems. Like I had this, this scene was completely different. You see this card here? If you could see it better. Is there a detail of that one? It's a. <laughs> The other, here, uh, in the original you can actually see through that I had painted a whole zoo scene in here. But <laughs> this card seemed better because of these two figures look like these little bowling items. So I changed that. So, th so that happens a lot in these where you come back the next day and you go, hmm. Just hmm, or what were you thinking, you idiot? Or like, oh, I hate you, oh or God. oh, you're brilliant. Usually, it's wow, this is great. When I leave, and I come back the next day, I go, not so great. Uh, Why isn't it great? Well, because this yellow is too bright. It should be this way, that way. This I probably spent more time worrying about this color here, and how that should be. I had before painted all of these origami characters. I also had another character over here. Why would you call this a character? It's just a trapezoid. Well, there was this guy smoking a pipe sitting over there. Oh, you had when a I painting got, here yeah. at one A lot point. of times it's not adding, it's subtracting. I'll oh, so there are postcards that are covered with paint that are lying no, on the I floor? No, I just don't. I don't. I, I remove them before I, you know, settle on them. So. Do you honor them when you take them? Do you give them a little burial? Uh... I hit them over the head and throw them on the street. And I, <laughs> I, I, I'm ah. wondering about your mood. I mean, there yeah. are people in your family here who could probably testify yeah. one way or the other. Yeah. But uh, when you are uh, when you're feeling happy, 
what do you do? Uh, when you're feeling frustrated, what do you do? Uh, when I'm feeling really sad, I go pet a dog. <laughs> or look at my lovely children and wife. Or go play pet hockey yeah, or something like that. But uh, painting actually keeps me more sane than anything. I also love photographing my dogs, which I do quite a lot. Uh, they require it, and it's something I do with friends. And but these are all dogless, these, so these, these are, are these all are solo things. Yeah. Go into my studio. It's just a typical artist, Garrett. You go in there and you shut the rest of the world off. I listen to usually uh, 20th century music rather than 15th century music, so uh, I feel like I'm part of my period, I suppose. Oh, so um, you have a, ra a radio on? Or a, or, I have or CDs. CDs. I used to listen to um, more grand music, and then my painting would get echo that, and it would Oh, so you're not actually God. listening to public radio, apparently. <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'll leave now. <laughs> um, can, we, can we go to scenic sets? Um, now this one, this is the last one of these, but I'm just, uh, this is a, uh, this is different altogether. So this is actually earlier than the later ones. Yeah. It's more how I worked when I was connecting those um, cabin scenes the, in, in Maine, where I would make one landscape sort of merge with, a, with another one somehow. So this is more like that, I suppose. Okay, so you can start up there uh, in the, and then and then the, you can take a boat here. You don't maybe want to go over the waterfall, but if you do, you'll land here. And then if you go back to the main painting, you can then go down from the waterfall. You can go around, I guess, tumbling through the sky, land on this road, hang left, and go to those mountains. And uh, to me. Um, it just, this is the sort of thing I was beginning to think. I was beginning to think that what pulls all these things together is a kind of where am I-ness. Uh, you're lost for a while, you're found. There seems to be a path through the woods um, and your eye can go either this way, that would be against gravity, or this way, which would be with the water, though the, you'd have to go uphill here. When you m build them, do you build a, a progression in your head? Are you going somewhere? Sure, it's just, uh, just as a painter would think, where does uh, this, this composition, where will it lead me? Where, where, how do you keep the eye pleasantly uh, um, moving along? And also sometimes it's kind of funny, like obviously I thought of the boat and the waterfall as being, oh, that's funny. Uh, not funny like my videos, which we'll show later, we'll but, show in a minute, but yeah. funny somehow well, you know so that that's what, uh, what i wrote yes when i was thinking about this yesterday i wrote to myself what did i write um uh is the plot of this fun follow the line follow the sea how long did it take is it lost and found do i ever get finished do i ever know i'm done if you look at james whistler you think well that's his mother like it's he knows exactly where he is but do you, I, I guess, is this the temperament of a restless man or a resting man who is enjoying the view? It's also a sensual pleasure of, look how lovely this color is that I've pulled out of this. It also kind of reminds me of my childhood copying pictures out of encyclopedias and so forth. Uh, being a chameleon, like uh, coming up with things that are... Um, suggested yeah. so there is uh, we can go back to there's a tremendous amount of, of very careful color control and tone management so in this one for example um, the tones are very very carefully maintained but I, I guess I, I, I was wondering going on to the to the videos um, I guess this, this, this is going to roll time back till when to about 1969 or something like that Pretty much. Yeah. So at the beginning, I, look, look, there's, maybe I should bridge it this way. Um, is this, in addition to being an example of what you have learned across your life about how to paint and how to, how to create an image that is managed, is this also uh, a deep giggle for you? Like, are you... Not at all. This isn't the the paintings aren't uh, funny at all. I you know I went to art school because I love to draw and paint. I went to art school finding that painting was dead, and so found myself doing conceptual art, photo, video, whatever it is. And then suddenly I was the guy with the dog. That's a whole another monster, which I come to really 
adore and actually like. Yeah. I'm really just going back to what's basic to me is I'm really a painter. I'm not a photographer. Ask my assistants. Uh, <laughs> the most annoying question I get, what kind of camera do you have? What f-stop did you use? I photographed the, the king of Belgium and he asked me what f-stop I used. And I, I don't know, king. I didn't know. You said that? I, I did. I said, oh, you're I supposed to lie to a king, really. Yeah. That's the well, my, the, the, my assistant was right next to me. I said, ask Jan, who uh, told him what <laughs> f-stop we were using. So I just don't have that. I never played with train sets. I, I was always in the woods making things and building stuff and painting and doing that kind of thing. So it really comes natural to me. It's but look at what you look at. Like so far in this little voyage, it's been it's been a very interestingly restless, deep meander. You don't seem to you seem to be looking around. Where to next, you ask the line. Like, n no one who isn't a b deeply restless is going to feel fenced in by a postcard. It would just not occur to them. So that's, it's, it's interesting That's to something me. for me to think about tonight. <laughs> before I go. All right, so, 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 so at some point when you were a kid, somebody gave you a camera, and then you began... As you do with postcards, you began doing ridiculous things with the camera. I mean, things that no one had done before. I was actually teaching at the University of Wisconsin when I first oh, put a camera in my hand when I was like 20 three or four. So the, that was my Was it the camera in your I hand as a pedagogue? As much as a pedagogue, you were supposed to you tell other people how to do something with it? You know, I would ask my friend, the artist Robert Cumming, to document something I was tossing off a building or floating uh, down a uh, river, and he said, Bill, get your own camera. So I got a camera to document my own performances and and installation works. All right, well, just radically, I'm just going to ask you just to, we're just going to put something that you did, I guess, probably around 1970. Uh, I just want to call attention to the fact that it involves very, very few elements. It involves two mouths and some milk. That's it. And let's just see what you did with two mouths and some milk. Those are two legs. That's the milk. It's disgusting. That's you, right? Yeah. adorable for about two seconds. And now the suspense builds. Oh God. <laughs> oh, that, that is so good. Now, uh, <laughs> Uh, I, uh, was this the, was this like s something you just tr I don't even I can't even imagine like w what uh, what happened? Well, I got this dog who was only six weeks old. You're supposed to get dogs at eight weeks because they don't know their dogs when they're six weeks. They think that you're a dog or something like that. But I was um, you know busy doing these installation and photo pieces, and the dog would come with me and always get in my way, and uh, he would emit. Sh he would emit this high-pitched sound when I wasn't working with him. Uh, if anyone knows Weimaraners, they sort of whine in a certain way, but as if he was working, if I thought him of something for him to do, he'd leave me alone. And he looked amazing. Uh, he, he was just a great performer, this dog. And I ended up doing several pieces with him. So was this just like an aggravation? You were just so aggravated the dog? He's like, I'm going to just spit milk on the floor and just do something? Or what? Well, but actually, this, it knew, seems more you know, well milk, milk looks great, I, but using it in my photo pieces, it photographs easier than water or soda. Uh, it just has a beautiful, in black and white, both photo and video, it looks beautiful. So I, I remember I was pouring it out in a, in a uh, in a bottle or whatever came in back in 1970 and uh, he would drink it up again. 
but I thought of pouring it out of my mouth. That was the sort of the thing that made this work better, I think. It was always amazing the way he would just do well, it. Was over it and an over accident? Again. Like, did you put the camera down and then the dog went and then you thought, oh my God, did it just mm -hmm. like, because you couldn't like, look at this. This was before the time where you could roll back and see what you just done. I, I could see it in the monitor, which I had right adjacent oh. to the camera. I could see, oh, this looks cool. The camera's good here. So look at how, how long that space looks. And if I just round this corner, this is a little duplex that I lived in in San Pedro. Uh, so it was, went from the living room to the kitchen backwards and then Man Ray went. But now here's the way. weird thing. Like I've heard of short stories and cartoons are short and Calvin and Hobbes is short. There's a lot of great things that are small and precious and perfect. There's poems that are short. But uh, until I saw this, I'd never really, any, I'd never seen anything quite so elegantly done visually that was so short. And also so incredibly simple in form, and so peculiarly uh, had a, a suspenseful build as the dog's black nose, it's the nose really, gets closer and closer to the lens and looms larger and larger, takes up more and more of the frame, and in your mind you hear yeah. at the end. Now that is actually a pretty beautiful piece of condensated thinking, and I just hope to God that you didn't just like do it by the by, that you you must have thought about it for at least a day and a half in order to pull off something. <laughs> well, I you know it was a long time ago, and I could make up any story that would <laughs> that would make you happy. But uh, but the truth uh, is, you just the truth just is, happened. I don't remember. You know, th these things were when I made these videos in the early '70s. It, it was it was almost like self hypnosis uh, because uh, remember I told you a story earlier of trying on a, a suit in seventh grade and seeing myself in a three way mirror for the first time. Yeah. It's a way of transforming you. You see yourself, but you're not really yourself. And uh, I just a lot of cool things came out of that process of that little triangle of the monitor, the camera, me, or the object somehow. Well, if you want it, like th this is this next thing I'm going to show you is. N incredibly short and incredibly perfect and incredibly you should understand this incredibly well before John Lasseter discovered his desk lamp well before John Lasseter discovered his desk lamp who's John Lasseter well yeah I didn't expect you'd know that but <laughs> Pixar like like the, that whole thing like oh, just I look at I this. know what you mean yeah oh mom Mom, I think Randy's going to be sick. You know that reminds me of the of the Hemingway thing, like like they like two shoes never worn for sale. It's the, the which they had some kind of competition, a bunch of writers in France, and they said let let's make something really short, really perfect, and, and, and where the limits are six words. Mom, I think Randy's going to be sick. Mom, I think Randy's going to be sick. Eight words. And yet you've got a couple, couple of nice sounds, too. And the best sound I think I just noticed was having the lamp hit a pillow that I propped up the character <laughs> for. So he would still be in frame and make kind of a more pleasant sound than hitting the floor with a crash. Well, right, what do you what do you do with something like this? Like like oh, it's 1971, and you're making short things that don't belong anywhere. Like where did you put them? Uh, well, um, they there were kind of group shows with other artists, and this would be these, played in an art gallery. These things were at, were starting to be uh, seen. I would edit them at Cal Arts, which was. Uh, um, a place and um, <laughs> and uh, people would notice and go oh that guy with the dog or the guy with the, they never said the guy with the lamps but uh, they, they got noticed and I, I'd be in I remember once when I first had a show in Europe I dragged my equipment over there to show it at the Hayward Gallery in London or some place like that so I was in these group shows and it'd be my video I remember seeing them at the Pasadena Museum in a group show and it, it, I said God this is kind of like being in front of the Mona Lisa at the Louvre there's a crowd of people around my painting but it's actually you know they're all bet. around my video there are other works on the wall people look at look at look, and then a crowd around
my stuff. So it, it was not perfect, but it was a, a way to to develop an audience, which I think I wanted. I, I really loved having an audience, and uh, I, I couldn't really make things for uh, for God like Bach did. So uh, you know, I liked to, that my mother liked my work, and that the technician that was helping me edit would stop looking at the oscilloscope and and see and look that. at your thing yeah and that was uh, so powerful th this then becomes like a rip roaring like all of a sudden this is not just drawing crowds at museums or getting people to stand this is like getting you on saturday night live you're at parties with with belushi I mean, like this. this well, goes nothing good ever happened from any of those things. <laughs> so the best thing is that you know that I did these and that they live right now. It lives. It lived at Sonnabend Gallery in 1973. It lived in Germany and lived, uh, you know, at in all of these places. And that's the the thing that I I liked being a artist working. First in the Midwest, I could have an audience in New York and LA or Europe, and, and it could be through the photographs, could be reproduced in a magazine, video could be broadcast, shown at NPR or uh, PBS or something, or, uh, you know. Well, then, did the Sesame Street people just call in the middle of this, or like what you happened? You know, this wonderful woman, Arlene Sherman, asked me, based on my early work, to, to do, thinking that I would be able to do something. Uh, for children, this was a department that would ask Mark Morris or Yo-Yo Ma to come and do do something. It wasn't working with Kermit or uh, or or any of the Muppets. It was just something that was produced outside. So I got a small budget, and every year would do hand in five or seven minutes. Uh, base they say we need something. Can you do something on? Uh, chemistry or the number six and three we could use and so I would take oh, suggestions. Really? It must have been yeah. interesting like we need yeah. something like with roses yeah. or whatever. Huh? Well can cooking be be science like chemistry? Okay you could do cooking so. so was that. that like like so now it seems to me that if you're trying to be a serious artist and show at Sonnabend and now you're on Sesame Street and you're drawing enormously and obnoxiously enormous crowds say at the museum that the other artists might decide to hate you just think. they didn't though because they, didn't. they were because um, I'm really a nice person and kind and uh, and there's no sense in hating me because what good would that do I mean, just <laughs> <laughs> so uh, that's that's interesting because I always thought that the art world was kind of um, tough that it looks dainty from the outside, but that inside it's full of of growling, ambitious people looking for the tiniest advantage. And so, if you walk in with what I happen to think are, I mean, I I have an essay in this new book about how how I was crazy about these videos, and they influenced a lot of people. I think in a way that that something beautifully, beautifully done, almost perfectly done, should. But I thought in the back of my mind, ah, but probably you got shit from the from the Madison Avenue people. But I well, guess you know the the um, I had a little uh, Hollywood fling where I made a film that was on Sundance. It was shot in thirty five millimeter. It was made in the early nineties. So I got to meet all of those. I had a Hollywood agent. Oh. I got to go and meet all of those people. And boy, did I ever flee that world. <laughs> so that is really a creepy That's world compared yeah. to the art world is much uh, you Okay, touche, as they yeah. say. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right, so, so now comes this, this very interesting thing that shows up in this book. It's just it's kind of fascinating. Um, at one point, for no reason that I can fathom, you painted a painting. Like we, should, it, we should do It's called V2-19 something. Let's go back up to the... Yeah. So, so th this is just a... This is two men in black suits uh, in some kind of white place. I don't know what this is, these things. Well, that's a uh, Kandinsky riff, because they're standing in front of a Kandinsky painting. Uh, this is the set from a Dutch TV show. I'm not sure which one, but... Uh, what do you mean it's a set from... It looks like a painting that you painted. Well, this postcard, the V2, is a postcard oh. of, a, of a TV set. 
And there's the lighting grid on top, which oh, I just yeah. continued. Oh, so here, this is it again. Yeah, I sort of echoed that. I see, oh, here it is again, actually. There you go. Okay. So we're in a, you, er, yeah. in a repeating TV set. And then these, th this card had just a little bit of this furniture in it. The card is here yeah. with a Kandinsky back there. Putin and this large person who turns out to be... Putin? Putin. That's Putin. Vladimir this, Putin? Yes. The very. Uh, okay. And he's standing next to a guy whose name I can't remember. Is this a postcard? Or yeah, it's, it? it was a postcard and for some reason. Is this here including this these so only is actually holding this thing the, the card stop you just see his hands and a little bit of black there it could okay. be like a walker you know it's not but uh okay I pretended it was a guy like him would not have Putin a walker, walker in public no no so what? <laughs> so, so anyway, wait, was this in the postcard collection from your friend Zivnev Vinev <laughs> Yeah, he gave me that. He, okay. He, yeah, right. along with some other, some some other things. So when you put Putin and, so and the tall guy into yeah. a painting, and then did you have any notion of why you were doing this, or it just was one of those days? It seemed like a wonderful place to paint, like Kandinsky, who. You know, Kandinsky is everyone's 1950s joke about modern art. Mm -hmm. You know, like you, if any cartoon that has shapes like this, you know, it's it's kind of based on Kandinsky. Okay. Um, so there it is. It right, is so crawling around, but also I'm just sort of having fun with these with these colors that are in the card yeah and uh making my own little story i mean it was re really fun to be kandinsky for that day so then you did something a little odd i don't quite understand you then told two gods or what are the remaining god that you would i don't know how did this painting like how many i don't know how many people have ever heard of bob and ray in 1970 or so if you could walk down many streets in New York on WOR, which is the radio station, there were these two guys who were um, straight comics, uh, very, very dry. One of them was a reporter and the other one was his anchorman or, yeah, yeah. And um, they would make up completely bizarre newscasts. And one of them was never get his mic on on time, so he would always be caught like mid-word. Ali Baloo, his always name was Wally, but you, he didn't get the w out because he didn't turn on the mic. And then they would proceed to make completely ridiculous fun of nothing in particular, actually. It yeah, was very they small. They were real minimalists. And, uh, now, they are in some way the radio version of what we just showed on your videos. And I guess you must have known that. And that somehow there is now going to be a car crash. Somehow this painting is going to get to one of them. Well, he, I met both Bob and Ray on the few uh, TV ex uh, appearances. Seems always when I was on Letterman or Saturday Night Live or even Johnny Carson, uh, Bob and Ray were also on. So I got to hang out with them in the green room. And uh, my first retrospective or my last retrospective book was published by Yale Press Bob Elliott's daughter was a designer there is that right Christine yeah so anyway I invited Bob Elliott to come to my show at the Brooklyn Museum and walked the museum was closed then, but I gave him a tour he was already quite old then but I, 2007 so you I walked just cold called him or you know you knew him enough to say well I don't know remember how I did me it, but not exactly I mean he he uh he he and ray were always very uh not at all jealous or anything like that or mean like no. oh you're doing stuff like us and they're like you're ripping us me off bill stay away not like that at all no. just jolly about it you know so but I'm quite fawning too. They were my heroes, so I was, you know. I mean, they, they, I, they're I, great. I don't exactly know how to explain this to you, but like these guys, for a certain kind of person, Bob and Ray, well, that would be like. Uh, well, I don't know, like, what things it would be like. out of like walking, and finding John Lennon, and Paul McCartney in your in your kitchen. Yeah, they they made it, made things out of the beginnings of TV and radio and sound and all of those things. They were real, yeah. basic kind of in a way that I. I realized that after I started doing it, it wasn't like, oh, I'm going to do stuff like Bob and Ray. I went, hey, wait a minute. So, so what did you do? You, did you send this? You sent, you, well, well he saw, the, he saw the, the, the book, and I wanted people like you. You were first on the list. And uh, 
and Bob Elliott would be uh, second. That's and ridiculous. And Amy, Amy Hempel, another writer that I'm friends with, and Susan Orleans, and, uh, and others. So he, um, he was the first person to deliver his essay. Uh, right away, he sent back this really funny piece on his stationery. Do you want to read it? I do. Okay. Dear Bill, <coughs> this is on... Uh, it's typed on his type. Uh, this would be like getting a typewritten letter from Abe Lincoln or something. This yeah. Is like big. So it's just here. It's just on one page, signed by Bob Elliott, looking really rickety at the bottom. Like the no, Bob like, looks like it's some sort like of like ninety-four years old. Would you write right. that? So well, it looked like no. It looks. It even looks like it might have been written by Eeyore or something. It was somebody not yeah. in a good. So it, and it says, "Dear Bill," in, uh, and really I can't because well, all right. In today's mail, a fat envelope from Publishers Clearinghouse containing congratulations to me on moving up from good customer to excellent status, probably because I of the jeweler's loop I bought last month. They also say that I'm maybe one of the possible winners in the possible winners group eligible for a million a year. But adding to that good news was a stack of work prints from your found postcard paintings. Flipping through them, I was surprised and delighted to see one with Bob and Ray in the center. Hey, Bob Jr., I called to my son, look at this. We're in a painting by Bill Wegg. And it's going to be in a new book. And now there's a little script. Junior, Dad, that's not Bob and Ray. The little guy looks like you, but it's not. It's Putin. And the big guy is, hey, Ray, do you mean Putin and Ray? No, 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 not, not Ray. It's some tall political figure that I can't remember. Like Charles de Gaulle? No, no. It's just like Ray on the right-hand side. You know, I almost remember doing that wheelbarrow, but I, no, it's not Putin with the wheelbarrow. It's not Penn and Teller either. No, the big guy, Penn, he's always on the left. No, you're beginning to hear. Take my jeweler's loop and get a closer look. Yep. It's Putin, all right. Okay, not Bob and Ray, but it is a dynamic painting, though. Pure Wegman. You can say that again, Dad. Hmm, I think once is sufficient. <laughs> <laughs> and it says, at the very bottom, it says, thank you. So, like, and then this is just mailed to you. Yep. And then, like a month later, it goes, did I miss the, the uh, publishing party? Because <laughs> uh, I had to wait for everybody else's essay. His came right away. Wow. And, and really spookily, he sent me a letter a week or two before he died saying uh, he was having radiation treatment from this cancer that he had. And, but good luck with the sales. And it was just so sweet. Unbelievable. Yeah, you know, in, in some ways... Uh, uh, this is maybe excessively romantic, but I if you have somebody that you just admire all the way down, and then they, sort of close to their exit, pay attention to you, gentle and admiring attention back, I don't think there's anything better than that, in a way. I, I want to end this by just asking you sort of a, a finalish question. Um, being being keeping company with people like that and with Kandinsky and with postcards and with postcard donors it seems like you like created a world which is catering to you in some i mean the idea that you could go for year after year after year waking up in the morning and getting postcards to play with and assistance to help you play and an imagination that keeps producing weird stuff and fun in the morning and maybe anger in mid-afternoon and then dogs <laughs> in the night not to mention kids and wife and stuff in that crazy house it feels like you've won the lottery or something do you feel surprised at how things have gone for you no well deserved <laughs> I set you up to be a nobleman and you just put me in the eye. <laughs> well, you know, you just, you, when things are going so, so nicely, you do have moments where you go, uh, but then when I go back and push some paint around on a panel, you, that, those, those thoughts recede. And are you, are you as interested today as you were like 30 years ago in what your fingers are doing and what your brain is doing to your fingers? what your brush is doing to the fingers and what the paint is doing to your brain does this still totally up grab you 
Absolutely. Yeah, it's, uh, you know, getting back to what deciding to do something I really love to do and realizing that it was dangerous to do so in 1985 after quitting painting and calling it dead and agreeing with everyone else that it was into doing it again was, I, I really had to go, oh well. You know, I'm sure I lost something by doing that, but it's what I really love to do, so. And then you have to sort of fight the feeling that maybe in this sort of hedonistic trip is, is not so lofty, but what am I going to do, you know? Uh, you know, I still do lots of other things, so if you were to see me on another day, you would see another Wegman, so it's okay. And do the dogs keep you uh, modest? We have a lot of them. Well, I don't have so many anymore. If you were, if you saw me last year, you would have seen four, and now you see two. Oh, I did so, see four. Yeah, you not see, there's two. just two now. So they only live a short while. So the question is, am I in my last two, or do I have time for more? Because I've had a total of ten dogs since 1970. I haven't had 200 like some people think, but uh, <laughs> that's what I thought. But uh, yeah. Oh. Well, that's a melancholy note, isn't it? Yeah. Okay, well, right now I, it's great because they're four and five, which is you know, early middle. Are they relatives mm. of the previous ones? No. No. These two are a whole new line. Good. So, you, so, so yeah. you're not going to get, you know, weird ones that play the violin with two fingers or something <laughs> like that. Okay. Uh, it, it, it is... On that rather weird note, is if you have anything to ask and you're brave enough to try, uh, then this is a good time to do that if you want. Um, Anyone have any know, questions? Just raise your hand and I'll bring you the mic. Yeah, it's a little bit weird to begin. Jason, you had a question. <laughs> no, your official question, you know, and you know that Atlas isn't going to do it, so. Yeah. There's somebody. Not that we can't hear you anyway. <laughs> hey, Bill. Um, I was hoping you could talk a little bit more about the importance of stories in your childhood and how that continues now, thinking about the Hardy Boys and the Hardly Boys. Yeah, there's a, there's oh, a whole the other body boys. of work that I did. A, uh, this movie that I was talking about where I went to Hollywood for a while, mm -hmm. I made a parody of... Uh, of the Hardy Boys, books that I love to read, terrible books, really, from the 50s, awful, really. But, you know, those, but, were, uh, those uh, were the, the books covers, The of covers were great, yeah. though, yeah, so. Yeah, for those of you who don't know what that is, the, there was a company called, it was written by a collective group of people who called themselves F.W. Dixon. Yes. They were actually like 50 people, probably, and they would write the story of two boys and their detective father. The detective father was always missing, going off, doing things, yeah. and they were left alone to solve mysteries. Yeah, two brothers. So I cast my dogs at the time I had four as the Hardly Boys. They were because the, the, they were girls. They were Hardly Boys. <laughs> they were <laughs> they were girls and dogs. And I sh and I shot it in 35 millimeter up in Maine. It's quite beautiful. It's about 25 minutes. And that's what you know. I had a couple couple of screenings in Hollywood, and that that led me there. Um, and the stories you wanted to hear about more. Just how those. Um, Sorry, how those uh, kind of formulaic tropes um, influenced later um, the stories that kind of come through in your painting and drawing. Could you help me out with that one, Emily? Because uh, <laughs> I'm feeling he has no idea what you're talking about. Strangely inarticulate at the moment. <laughs> um, I guess just really how do you ever fall back on on something that feels familiar when you're doing when you're connecting postcards or does it always feel very new and and do you not know where you're going to go with each well with each certainly card? uh when i was a kid i used to copy pictures out of books all the time and i feel like i'm doing that i used to imagine what it was like looking out the window and not seeing around it what what could be behind my head when i'm not looking at it things like that um but the stories that I would choose for my dogs uh, all came out of this cast. There was Faye, who was the mother of the rest of them. So I had this family, uh, like an acting family. So the stories that I thought of doing, or any of those Sesame Street routines that we did, were based on what they would be good at and what they might look like. And the, the lines that I would write for them were all written afterwards uh, based on what 
it seemed like they were saying rather than what I wanted them to say. Have you ever thought of like making a radical casting change and like just working with turtles? Or you know, I've been working on that. I was going to give a talk about that tomorrow at another bookstore. <laughs> but we might as well talk about that now. Can we go to the turtle slides, please? <laughs> Wouldn't that be great if yeah, I just reveal, open the curtain on your yeah. other life? <laughs> your reptilian period. Yeah. <laughs> no, so you're just a like dog guy and you know, and a cat makes you feel just ill at ease. My, I love cats, but they don't like me and my dogs make them crazy. So, okay, so cats enough. have appeared a couple of times in, in, in one in Cinderella notably a book that I made mm -hmm. and I did actually a whole uh, series of pictures on Abyssinians for Connoisseur magazine and they were wonderful to work with very dog like huh. Abyssinian cats any uh, have you ever gone radically away from the mammalian group like have you ever talked about ever for example spent time with frogs or maybe there were some butterflies that uh, uh can I tell you about a book that just didn't happen and what was going to be my last children's book my dog is not a dog my dog is a frog my dog is a cat my dog is an elephant <laughs> because I've photographed my dogs as so many different kinds of creatures and That's the wrong answer. That that means you're sticking with dogs. Just do, using you're there just bearding for dogs. Really, <laughs> that's a good one. Yeah, no, yeah. that that's not right. If you wanted to sort of get free, like you have from your postcards, mm -hmm. you're going to have to promise yourself nobody else. Yeah, snakes. You know, it's a, an all snake show or something like completely different. You know, I talked to somebody from Hollywood, animal actors who worked with camels and lions and elephants. What's your favorite animal to work with? Dogs. It's the only they're the only ones that like doing it. <laughs> so, <laughs> so we're stuck, I think, okay. if you're me anyway. We have another question back here. Stand up. Hey Bill. Hi, I'm Hello. over here. Hi. Hello. Um you said earlier you started to say that you said the paintings the paintings aren't funny, which was funny to me because they're full of humor, right? So is it what did you mean can you expand on that a little bit? I think drawings can be funny and uh, video can be funny, but paintings, they weigh too much. They have like the weight of history also on them. So there's too many burdens for, for it to be really funny. And I really like humor in, in art per se, uh, and especially paintings. They could be whimsical, I suppose. Uh, like a Haydn symphony is whimsical, and, but you don't laugh like you do with a milk video or something like that. So, or one of my drawings can be funny, but I think paintings you don't, you, there might be mirth or whimsy, but I think funny is not it for me. Up here. Thank you. Keep well, stand up. Wait, sure. Okay. Um, so when you, I was originally going to ask about the dogs, but so w <laughs> when you were looking at the paratrooper and the, and the woman, you don't you didn't see that as you think that's just mere whimsy or uh, well in the museum and you know by the time I um, delivered the whole four by six foot painting, I don't think the effect is the same as seeing milk floor piece or Randy sick where there's like a. It, it delivers right. the thing. Or if it's a drawing that looks like it could be a New Yorker cartoon and there's almost like a, well, that's a really funny like a punch line. thing. There's something well, about... There, there the could be a Bob and Ray middle, right? Like <laughs> the Bob and Ray were very funny, but you never laughed out loud. You just, you just... What would you just do? You just you know, there's some kind of interior smile. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, they're very dry. Could I, could I squeeze in a dog question? Of course. Yeah. So... Did you train, I mean, when you ha had Man Ray and you found this, you know, that he was so uh, perfect, mm. you know, um, for what, you, you, you know, draping him in these, in these positions, and was he just so malleable? I mean, did you, did you, did you yeah. get a dog trainer, or was this all just <laughs> Yeah, your, uh, uh, just all on the job, and the, the dogs are really, they're, they're in my hands, they're like clay. Uh, especially this dog, Batty, who was, was uh, Faye's... Um, I mean, I could drape her over anything. I just saw a picture this morning that I did some years ago of her on a glass bubble. She just draped right over. I mean, and I never used to have to uh, drug them for their x-rays. They just would just go <laughs> like that. But the two that I have now won't do that at all. 
they're, they're not so much hypers, they're, they won't lie flat. I could never do a dog alphabet with them. They're just, <laughs> on things are magnificent. They look better than any other dog I've ever had, the two, their brother and sister. But they're, they're just massively uh, alert and, uh, and one, one gives you a lot of psychology when she do, does it. She wants you to know that she's really doing it. And the other one is just, I'm a god. <laughs> <laughs> so I kind of go with what the dogs are giving me a little bit. And after photographing them for years and years, you find out more about them that makes you kind of fall in love with them. You really see the angle. Oh, there's the batty look. There's the crooky look. There's, oh, that's so chundo. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, that was batty. She's so great, right? Who? What other dog could do that? Only her. Yeah. I think we have time for one more question, if that's okay. Uh, it's not really a question. It's really just a comment. Hello. Hi. And um, I just love how you've brought to our minds the importance of finding your passion or sometimes rediscovering your passion and how often we have to go back to our youth or even our childhood and remember what our passions were at that time, our interests. And for you with your painting, you know, it's so wonderful you've come back to that painting and really have this, this, this uh, chance to fulfill your life in that way and rediscover. Yeah, when you when move you on, you, you realize you're going to lose something by uh, going somewhere, but you just can't worry about that. Right, Robert? Did you ever, did you ever think of yourself as a grown-up? I never really had to. Uh, fortunately, my, my uh, helpers take care of that for me, <laughs> keeping me helpless. And I've learned that the more helpless I am, the better off everybody is. <laughs> the everybody else's are just keeping quiet in the audience. Yeah, right? really. <laughs> but th that's, I think, that to, 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 go to comment on your comment, I think there are some people, and they're, they're, they, you can find them anywhere. I mean, they can be plumbers. They can be, but there's some people who didn't, don't lose the astonishment of uh, waking up every day. I, it, you know, it, for some reason, they just open their eyes and go, whoa! Uh, instead of okay, oh, and that's uh, I think that's pretty. I evident. think being an artist is a you know occupational hazard in a way. It it really um, makes you d after so many years of doing it, it y you know s things happen to you. I suppose good things for me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> All right. So now well, I don't know what the deal is with the book uh, signing. We'll um, line up here and sign the books. Thank you okay. for such a pleasant so evening, William Robert. Thanks for. Wonderful.